outside its boundaries and proceeds. It is with this outside and forward-looking lens that progressive Christians look at the person of Jesus. To my surprise, each of the interviewees had a very high regard for the person of Jesus. However, as one would expect, the view of each person regarding Jesus was other than mainstream. I will allow the participants to speak for themselves. To quote one participant, Jesus is the model of what humanity could be. I think Jesus is a much more powerful figure as a human than he could be by being divine and human. His humanity was awesome. Little wonder they called him God. Just think of his inner strength. He had to live in a society and <coughs> as he acted, he treated women as people, which was not common. He treated the marginalized with respect and with aid. Another participant puts it this way. The universe story would rank Jesus as the greatest man who ever lived on earth. He made a huge difference to the people of his time and to others. I see him as divine in the sense that the rest of us can be divine. We may never reach the level of divinity or the depth of understanding and wisdom that he did. But I think as humans, we are all divine. We are all musical. But he was Mozart. We can all add up numbers, but he was Einstein. The third participant, without hearing the other interviews, picked up the same theme. So Jesus was simply this person, a spiritual genius. It's like Mozart or Beethoven or Einstein. They were geniuses in their own field, music, science. Jesus, for whatever reason, was a spiritual genius. The spiritual genius was this profound openness and sense of connection with the sacred underlying reality that we call God. He had a profound sense of being a conduit for the presence of God in the world. Jesus was predisposed as a result of good genes or whatever. There was something special about him in the spiritual sense. It's the same way with I and I and Sarah. They had something special. There was something special about Jesus. The discussion of Jesus as being human as opposed to the literal Son of God, inevitably leads to a discussion of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. With the emphasis on Jesus, the human person, the idea of the virgin birth is not required. And it is felt that not adhering to the belief of the virgin birth may remove questions from the minds of some inquirers, that is, some potential church members that may be put off by the discussion of a virgin birth. It's one less thing to have to contend with. The consensus of the participant was that the virgin birth was just a way of saying that Jesus was a very special person. Just a storyteller's way of saying how special Jesus was. 
One person said about the virgin birth, when people in my congregation heard that I was not downplaying the specialness of Jesus, that I was just trying to reframe for them what the specialness consisted of, and it wasn't the virgin birth that made him special. They started to feel better about it and less threatened and opened up. The virgin birth is just a storyteller's version. Some people struggle with the virgin birth. If you take the virgin birth away, are you somehow taking away the special <coughs> of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus? I had to, he continued, reframe for people what the divinity of Jesus was all about. He continues, the way I frame Jesus for people today, and when you look at it cross-culturally, if you look at people who had a profound connection with spirit throughout the world's traditions, they are spirit people. Native traditions, Zen, Buddhism, Judaism, and so on. It is Christians who want to make their Jesus unique by the virtue of the virgin birth. There were all sorts of reasons for the virgin birth 2,000 years ago. Look at the Caesars who were the sons of gods. They were considered the sons of virgins. <coughs> for me, the critical thing about Jesus is that he was a spirit person who had a profound openness and awareness of his connection with the divine. That's what made Jesus unique, not the virgin birth. Jesus was not the only spirit person. There have been others throughout history, but Jesus was within our tradition, within our history. The progressive Christian movement have a different view of God than traditional Orthodox Christians. To those not in the progressive Christian camp, the view of God may very well come across as seriously unorthodox, and I mean orthodoxy as the traditional belief of the church. One of the participants described it this way. The concept of God is broad and is brought down from the heavens as well as placed in the heavens. God is energy. There is a God force that occupies the molecules within us, that occupies everything on the earth, everything in the universe, the universe is divine, but it doesn't want you to worship it. It wants us to be it. It's a loving energy in everything. It is similar to First Nation spirituality, where there is a reverence for all creation. Another participant explained God this way. <coughs> energy is synonymous with God. Everything that is an expression of energy is God. To understand theology, we have to engage science and psychology because whatever reality there, there is, there is only one reality. We must ask ourselves what the nature of energy is. What is the push that caused the Big Bang? What is the push that caused evolution? Energy seems to come together in ever more complex forms. The energy eventually produced life and human life, then this kind of consciousness. Surely there is a push to become knowing and a self-conscious universe. The qualities of energy and the qualities we have attributed to God are one and the same. <coughs> there is a variation on the theme of God by the next participant. God is everything and everything is in God. The way I have come to interpret that over the years is that everything is a modification of God. Whether it's you, me, 
even things like trees. Everything is a modification of this single reality. God is in the tree, the tree is in God. It's like a unified field theory, trying to find one energy that runs the universe. My faith has always needed to connect with temporary, contemporary science. I see everything as a modification or construct of this single reality. We are here as a result of one single construct of power or energy. Our ultimate identity, and I often like to describe it like this, is a sandcastle on the beach. You have a beach, you have the sandcastle. The sandcastle is simply a modification of the sand. Continuing, so in my understanding and experiential sense of it, you are as much an expression of God as me. And you are the expression of the underlying life of God, so you share in this life. We share this profound underlying connection and bond. While I understand you to be an expression of a single life, of which I am an expression as well, it changes the way I relate to you. It leads me to relate to you out of profound respect, consideration, and even love, ultimately. At the deepest level, we have this profound bond. We have one life that is the same in the earth. This justice, these justice issues we share, this recognition that we all share one life, that the planet itself shares in one life, calls us to a justice, and moral sensibility as well. That's it for the heavy stuff. Some surprises that I found. There were a couple of surprises in my research. They were pleasant surprises. I was surprised by the demeanor of the persons I interviewed. They were not broken down or defeated, wishing for old days when there were answers. They were people who were serenely at peace with nature and God. They had come to terms with a relationship with the divine, with the personal service, with prayer, and the people in the world around them. I had not expected this of such Sinners. They were, from what I could see, content with their ministries and content with their world. There was an interesting common denominator among the participants of the study that may very well have prepped them for a bent toward the rest of this year. They were from families that were considered adequately educated for the day. <coughs> However, at home there was an honest and healthy skepticism about religion. Question raised, questions raised at church were answered honestly at home. In one home, the Santa Claus myth was not even entertained. In another instance, a Sunday school teacher brought a shellac rib to Sunday school and explained, this is where women came from. These questions were answered honestly at home. One participant heard a well-known preacher preaching hard and loud on the radio about the existence of God. His response was, if he has to preach that hard and that loud about God, maybe there's some question about God. These participants were encouraged to be skeptics at an early age. One participant described his spiritual journey as wandering in the wilderness for many years, pastoring churches, preaching what he didn't believe. From time to time in the desert there was men, just enough to sustain. But now he feels like he's home, at least looking across to the 
promised land. There were tragedies and families mishandled by the Orthodox Church that led to questions of concept of God. This led to individuals seeking alternate views of God. There are only a few surprises during the research. Initially, my title was A Broken Hallelujah. It was to reflect the broken hallelujah of those who had grown tired in the traditional Orthodox faith and slipped into agnosticism while still leading their congregations. That designation does not apply. It has been my experience that the hallelujahs of those I interviewed are quite intact. I found no broken <coughs> Everyone is not a progressive Christian in the sense that we're discussing progressive Christianity. Yet, Christianity continues to be the fastest growing religion on the planet. Granted, this is due to various forms of Pentecostalism and its growth in specific areas around the world. In our backyard, where church growth is at best stagnant, would a form of progressive Christianity stimulate an interest in religion and church attendance? <coughs> Possibly. <coughs> but on the negative side of the coin, what effect would the embracing of progressive Christianity have on the adherence of the historical Orthodox traditional church? It might not be positive response. Contemporary Christianity is not for everyone. It takes a degree of independence and often traveling a path less trodden. As evidenced by church attendance, church closures, traditional Orthodox Christianity may not be readily equipped to meet the spiritual needs of future generations. However, for the optimistic and possibly pragmatic present, there are Christians who meet on Sunday mornings to practice their religions in song, in sermon, in sacrament. Whose is it to say theirs is a broken hallelujah? In this search, in whatever we perceive to be God, and we respond to that revelation of God upon us, there are no elements. Amen.
individual spouse was in the hospital, touch and go between life and death, and it didn't enter his mind to ask a deity to intervene. That answers your question. Yeah. Well, maybe. Um, my understanding of Orthodox Christian prayer is that it changes me, not God. Um, so I don't know how that differs from Orthodox understanding. Um, the, I suppose the second question follows from this one. Uh, the description of everyone as being modifications of one underlying substance, God. Or energy, which are originally used um, as just a lot of uh, reminds me actually more uh, than anything the ethics of Spinoza, uh, which says that there can only be one infinite substance, the only infinite substance is God, body and mind are modifications of that substance, we are alterations and modifications of substance. Where does salvation? What would salvation, what form would salvation take um, for a progressive Christian? I mean, a classical Christian sense of salvation is soundless, right? That your personhood remains in the same, but if we're standing on the beach, when the tide comes in, goodbye, castle. Mm -hmm. But the sand is still there. It's a different form. Um, I think for, for uh, salvation, there has to be a fall for there to be a salvation. So uh, the fall uh, would be foreign to progressive Christianity. Uh, thank you. Do you Thank you, Don. I, I just need to be reminded of what your research question was. As a United uh, Church of uh, Canada minister, how has the God question developed for you in a progressive or unorthodox manner? That was it initially, and then I modified it. Some people were having difficulty with. Uh, the God question aspect. So the modification is, or how has the question of the manifestation of the God entity developed for you? That may be making it more confusing. Great, thank you. And Helen, and then Rob. Helen. Uh, I'm 
sure you could just easily toss it out and have what you have, but um, there is an attempt to maintain the Christian tradition.
this people wanting to have discussion. Um, an interesting book by Jim Hood, The Sonnet's Church, kind of gave me a different view of even in some traditions, people preaching things that they don't necessarily believe because they're in a tradition. It's a very interesting book. And um, the Center for um, Pain and Center for Christian, um, Progressive Christianity had a long conversation with them, and, and, and the concept was not a group of people that have these certain symbols necessarily, while well, some might. It is a place to allow the conversation to happen around these, these different um, views and thoughts. But interestingly enough, I have found that there's, like I said, as many as there are people, there are different ideas <coughs> of tradition. So. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ford is this Catholic priest, I think, just got elevated to some sort of position in the Christian Catholic Church. And then there's uh, Spa, uh, two very, they're very intelligent men, and they're way out there. Yeah. And very different. Yeah, more, uh, more United Church people fall Spa and more of an angry, just let you know. <laughs> My, my name is Don Murray, and my partner here, Emily Kirsten, we're both retired United Church ministers, and we're two of the ones that were interviewed. And so I want to thank Don for bringing this subject uh, uh, into this arena. Uh, really a very good glimpse. But I, I hope you realize it's only a glimpse. If you really want to, you know, delve into these things, uh, Invite us in for a series of lectures. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, truly, there's no other way that you could possibly get a, get a hold of this. Uh, it is a time of the changing of the gods. And uh, we had better be aware of it, because there, there's kind of wondrous things happening out there. And uh, we're quite, uh, quite glad to be a part of it. And there are things emerging that uh, they'll be with you all your lives. So I hope you do take the opportunity to delve into some of the leading edge stuff that is actually happening. Thank you. And Don has uh, two more questions. Don has um, written two books in Asian Tragic History on this in this area. Um, I was just thinking of uh, a new litany, perhaps, you could use. You could say, as a leader, I don't know, and we could respond, and neither do we. I'm not impressed. <laughs> Thank you, Don.